Good afternoon. I'm Bob Blum, and I'm uh, the director of uh, the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute. It's really a tremendous pleasure and very exciting for us and great fun uh, to see everyone here. Most of you know uh, the work that uh, is going to be both presented and discussed uh, this evening has been over two years in process. Many of you have spent long hours uh, crafting the instrument, the survey that was used. Uh, uh, many of you sat once a month for two hours on a, on a Thursday evening uh, developing the project. And now we're at a point where we can share some of what we have found and really begin to have a conversation about how to use information to improve the health and well-being of our communities. And that's what this is about. It is not a lecture. It is not about statistics. It is about how you use information to um, really make it work for the community. We've had some extraordinary people involved with uh, this initiative. Uh, we have had people from uh, each of the five zip codes who have worked as data collectors and uh, neighborhood residents who have worked with data analysis. And I would just ask those uh, who were data collectors and were interviewers uh, and were involved with uh, collecting and coding and analyzing the data, please stand so we can uh, recognize uh, your contributions. It really is because of you that this uh, work has happened. Doesn't happen because of uh, people at Hopkins. It happens because of you. So we are all very indebted to you. I would like uh, uh, to turn uh, the podium over uh, and uh, to move into the initiative uh, and discussion. So Chris Gibbons, you have the floor. Thanks, Bob, and welcome to all of you for coming tonight. We're so happy that all of you were able to make it. We have a lot of ground to cover, and we want to hear a lot from you, so why don't we get started? But just before we get started, a couple of things. Bathrooms are right to my right over here. Um, dinner is coming in about an hour, so we are not, won't, won't make you uh, die of hunger tonight. And something else. Oh, we are videotaping everything. The reason we do this is so that, as, as you know, with our other events, we put it up on the internet because, so others can see, others can participate, and interestingly, others around the country are looking at what we have been doing and want to do the same thing. So you're making history even as you're, you've been here. We've gotten in, inquiries from, from across the country about this over the years. So um, just be mindful to try to speak loud. I think there's a mic out there somewhere that, that, that's, that you can get when it's your, when your time to speak so that we can um, hear you as well as see you. All right. Any other, anybody have any questions so far? Great. Well, what we thought we would do, there, there are a lot of new faces tonight, some that we haven't seen, some we haven't seen in a while. So we thought we'd take a few brief minutes just to review what we have done. Let me just see by show of hands. How many people are brand new? This is the first time you've ever come to any meeting of this, for this, okay, so we got, I don't know, maybe a, a third of, of people here, great, great, well welcome. Um, this initiative is unique in that we always welcome those who are willing to work with us. So why don't we get started and um, in review. Well, that's the agenda. All right. So. What we're going to talk about tonight is the data or the responses from what 
you may have heard already is the Community Asset Mapping Project. But that actually is part of a bigger initiative of which those who have been involved have been a part of over the last uh, three years or so called the Community Health Initiative um, that we have developed a little tagline, creating a healthier East Baltimore together. Um, and so there, this is what Bob was referring to when he talked about the meetings. We had several work groups, working groups, our original goals. I won't read all of these tonight because you have them in your handouts. You can take them with you. But we had a strong desire to start something that would allow us, us that is East, residents of East Baltimore and organizations of East Baltimore, to work together collaboratively, equitably with Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins faculty, Johns Hopkins staff, Johns Hopkins leadership to craft the vision and to do the work and to create a better and a healthier East Baltimore. Um, and, and those are the specific goals that we had. One of the things that we originally thought would be necessary to accomplish this goal was to do a health assessment. Many times health assessments are done when you start large projects, and many times that's the first thought, because you say, oh, well, let's find out where the health needs are and go forward. Well, in talking with those who were working with us over the early months, we heard over and over again, yeah, we understand the need to do a health assessment, but guess what? We've been through many health assessments here in East Baltimore, and there are many things that we know that you guys never ask about. There are many things in East Baltimore that we rely on that are positive, that are assets that help us thrive here in this community that are not just bad things, that are not just needs. And you never ask about those. And so it was really because of feedback and discussion that we got from all of you that were with us and others that we decided to switch. We stopped and said, hey, that's a good point. You're absolutely right. So let's get rid of the needs assessment. Maybe we'll do one later, maybe we won't. But let's understand what this, these, these assets, these supports are. That's never been done in a comprehensive way, the way that we, we ultimately decided to do it here in East Baltimore. So it was a result, again, of the dialogue that we had with everybody who was a part of the process that we shifted gears and fo to focus on an asset mapping uh, project process. Um, and as you can see there, real briefly, what assets uh, we had, we decided on seven different kinds of assets that we would explore. And you'll hear more about those tonight the physical assets, voluntary groups, and neighborhood associations. There may be paid groups or institutions, how people make money, individuals can be considered assets as well as the stories, the things that may have happened a long time ago that we might be proud of that make us stand tall about East Baltimore that nobody ever hears about or thinks it even exists. Those are assets. And um, communication, the ways that we communicate are all types of assets. And finally, at, you know, at first we said, oh, okay, well, who, who are the experts around the country to do this and, and to first show us how to do it and lead the process? And what we decided, what we learned is, you know, experts are good, external experts are good, but we, we got a good sense about what we, what we want to do and what we need. So we got rid of the external um, experts and we worked together. We worked together to define it. We worked together to develop it. We worked together to do it. We work together to analyze the data and, now, and, and to start analyzing the data. And now, at this, we're continuing the process with you to finish analyzing the data, to report the data, and then to take action on that data. And that's basically been the process that we have used over the last few months. There's a lot more detail. You have some of it in your packets. But for the sake of today, we'll stop. Does anybody have any questions about that or anything that really wasn't clear? Or, or actually, some of you that were involved in that process want to want to want to tell us what you thought briefly about uh, what happened or your experience with with the process. Anybody? Now I know Leon, you got some comments. Now. Nothing, nothing you want to. Anybody want to say? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. 
All right. Well, if you do, feel free to raise your hand and stop us at any time. I'm going to turn it over to Phil. Phil is going to talk about sort of the other, some other aspects um, with the project. Good afternoon, everybody. So, I'm, I'm Phil Leaf. I'm the Senior Associate Director, and I'm sort of going to be talking about the Christmas past. Uh, so, phase one, one of the things we recognize is there's a lot of data out there. Uh, not necessarily collecting new data, but how do we get these pictures of Baltimore, and then how do we make it more available to folks? A lot of times, community associations, neighborhood associations, programs need to at least have some description of, of what, what are they at now, as they're talking about how things can be improved. And so uh, the goal of sort of our first phase, which was sort of, you know, as we're getting the assets collected, which took a while, what other things are already available? What can we be, make, what can we be collect, not collecting, but sort of figuring out where it is? And, and there's a, one of the assets in Baltimore uh, is, is the Baltimore Neighborhood Alliance. Um, and Seema and one of her colleagues is here. They're, they have a huge repository of a lot of existing data, demographic data, data from the health department, from the school system that's there, uh, and every year they update it. And so you all got a report, but one of the things, this is sort of just an example, uh, of data that was available, this was for high, you know, elevated blood levels, which is not good, and um, you can see darker, the yellow is you know, sort of lower and the darker is higher. And you can see that in East Baltimore, we have a lot of children who were tested age zero to six who had high blood levels. Now this might be important because what right now is, the city has what they're calling fair student funding, that every student, schools get funded by basis on the number of students that are there. But if certain students from certain communities have different needs, uh, and for example, exposure to, to lead, which we know is related to learning things. Well, fair funding may be making sure that they're getting enough money to so they can achieve at the same level, as well as working on reducing the lead. And you see, for most of East Baltimore, there, it's not elevated, so this is not something that's all over East Baltimore. Uh, but there's certain parts of East Baltimore that, that were still high, and so the purpose of this is just as an example. And that one of the things we want to be able to figure out and, and work with you is as your neighborhood groups, other groups are, are, are doing your projects, how can we help you access the data that is available? And as many of you know, uh, Binia has a data day uh, every summer where they have a whole day where they go over lots of different data that's there. And that what we're planning on doing is sort of collaborating with them and having a separate day that we're really going to be focusing on sort of the interpretation of some of these data around some of the health issues. Uh, so that we can again increase your access to these data. These are not data that need to get collected. These are data that are relatively available, and they may be useful for you uh, for your programming. And, and as also as Chris said, baseline data. You know, essentially, this is where things look like now. As we look at the assets, as we look at making these assets more available, as you make the assets more available in your neighborhoods, things are going to get better. And these data may be useful to be able to demonstrate that indeed things are getting better. So as, when you came in, uh, you got the, this packet uh, uh, that describes some of these um, indicators and their relationships. And the purpose, again, is just thinking about these illustrations. Uh, and that as, as you have sort of needs for looking at some of these data, how can we make these things uh, accessible for you and support your efforts to both document the good work that you're doing, the improvements that are being made in East Baltimore and Baltimore in general, uh, as, as well as looking at needs. So, uh, let's see if there's any questions. So, Ernest, next up. Good evening to everyone. My name is Ernest Smith, and I am the co-chairman for the Monument McKelvey Fair Modernization Plan. But I also served as the co-chairman for the methods team, as well as one of the coders for this for this asset mapping process. And what I'm going to be talking with you about this evening is the methodology that were developed in order to carry out this project. 
carry out phase two of this project, which was the asset map component. And one of the thing, one of the goals of this project overall was to identify the full complement of assets across five zip codes in East Baltimore. And then, and those assets would be in the areas of the social, material, cultural, political arena. And then also to identify those aspects of health and the determinants of health or the social determinants of health that are most of most concern to many of the residents of East Baltimore. And so as we look at this and we will the discussion will follow a six step process. In step one we developed our interview guide as it was mentioned earlier, we developed the interview guide. Then after we had after it was developed and approved by the uh, all partners, then we move forward to identify and train data collectors, and afterwards we move forward to interview East Baltimore residents about the, the assets in their communities, and afterwards we started coding the data. But tonight, and this is now that we've gone through steps one through four, tonight we're going to move to step five, which is we will begin to discuss that data as it has been found the data that we were able to find as a result of these interviews, but also one of the, the next step, which is what are the things we want to do with that data once we have it? Because that becomes the key. We went through all this and what was it all for? To determine what it is we're going to do next. So in developing our interview guide, the all partners generated our ideas. There was a wonderful interview a guide that was started and it got ripped to shreds. For those who were here, I remember the first interview guide was ripped to shreds, uh, but the suggestions were taken and it was brought back. The Memphis team then began to draft an interview guide and we continued to get feedback from the all partners and ultimately the interview guide was developed, it was approved by the all partners and as a matter of fact, that interview guide is what we moved forward with and the interview guide was, the purpose of it was really to move it from being a survey. Because many times when we go out and you have people doing these assessments, they always seem to do a survey. And one of the things that we wanted it to be was we wanted it to be a guide to a conversation. So that what happens is that we're not hearing from the interviewers most of the time, but we're hearing from the residents and organizational leaders here in East Baltimore. And then, it would, and the purpose of it being that conversation, as you will see, is that it would provide an opportunity for people to tell us about East Baltimore. Tell us what they felt was good, sometimes what was bad, and sometimes the things they just didn't really care about. And, but the key to it all was that it was not to be a word-for-word -word script. In other words, when we walk in, I don't just ask, and as a result of it, we were after, as it was pointed out earlier, we were after seven asset types, also known as asset buckets. And those things revolve around physical assets. So as you can see, the list is, has been generated for you, physical assets. But two of the assets here, three of the assets here, generally do not show up in most asset mapping studies. And those were the things that became key. Number five, six, and seven. I just need everyone to focus on five, six, and seven, which is individual assets. Very rarely, if you look at any asset map, what you will not find is who are the individuals in a community that are important to that community. The next thing, stories. Stories are a valuable asset. It tells you where people have come from, it tells you where people are, and then hopefully it can tell you about where those people want to go. And then the final one is communication. How many of us have actually got flyers in the door, looked at them for a moment, and then threw it in the trash? Or watched it blow down the street? So the real question is, how, does, how is communication truly effective? How can we have effective communication in each other? What are the methods by which individuals really pass information one to another so that things can begin to happen in East Baltimore? Yet, if you look at most of the surveys on communication, they say use a flyer, use media, and what you'll find is that this is a surprising 
asset mapping study when it came down to communication. Some of the standard methods just were just thrown out the window. Next, um, as we move forward, the all partners require. One of the things that was important is that those asset data collectors be from East Baltimore. That became important because one of the things that we had to look at was if someone came, when, as you go out and you look at East Baltimore, it should be someone who kind of knows something about East Baltimore, is able to really have a conversation with someone from East Baltimore about the things that they will be hearing about in East Baltimore. And so one of the things that the All Partners require is that, they, that all the data collectors be from the, uh, from the target zip, zip codes that were being evaluated. Uh, Civic Works was chosen as the organization that, to, that facilitated our hiring. And our data collectors were hired and they underwent a 40 hour training. And they also underwent in-field trainings and evaluations. Some of the things that they were reviewed on included such things as um, having, holding a conversation or conversational interview. Also, they also did uh, listening, listening sessions. We had an eight-hour session on listening sessions about how to listen to people and not just be able to sit there and just talk to them, but really hear what it is they have to say and help them to, generate, to organize their thoughts. So those are some of the things that our data collectors underwent, some of the training. And at this point, we will hear from some of our data collectors. We're going to ask Ms. Alvia Smith to come forward. Good evening, everyone. My name is Althea Smith, and I was one of the data collectors. The first thing I'll be speaking on is recruitment and outreach. We did a lot of recruitment and outreach, and we are focused on specific locations, such as Northeast Market. We pretty much had like community health fairs there. We did Stop, Shop, and Save. Um, we also went out to Douglas Homes. And we also did a lot of recruitment on the street where we just walked up and down the street and met different people and talked to them about the initiative. We did a distribution of flyers and brochures. We handed them out in the community and all the five zip codes. The interview process, we contacted and scheduled interview with community residents who said they were interested in being interviewed during outreach. We conducted interviews immediately when a community resident wanted to be interviewed on the spot. So we actually went out in the community and when people were interested, we actually did interviews on the spot. Sometimes people weren't comfortable doing the way we were, so we actually took them back to the Urban Health Institute office where we held the interviews. We were also doing in the residents' homes and also like libraries and different organizations. What did data collectors hear from residents? Well, we heard a lot of different things. A lot of people were pretty um, curious to find out about the initiative. A lot of people were talking about the resources in their communities. And then also we we found out a lot of people had different resources in their own communities and they weren't aware of those. And by us interviewing a lot of organizations, we found out that they provided a lot of services that some of the people needed that they weren't aware. Both positive and negative things about Hopkins, such as people use the university, we found out a lot of people use the hospital, the clinics, and a lot of specialty services. And a lot of people were receptive, but some are, but some were pretty apprehensive. What were some of the challenges? Well, we faced a lot of challenges as well. Some experiences of racism and pushback about being in neighborhoods. Younger interviewers tend to talk about a lot of negative more than the positive. But actually, they had a lot of positive things because they was they would give us a lot of resources in their community, which were you know good things to have, such as like libraries, 
um, different clubs, different after school programs. So it was a lot of positive as well. Some residents felt that they were snitching and they were fearful to talk. Some residents are not always aware of what exists in their communities. They go outside of their community for the things they need. And like I said, suspicious of intent of the interviews. They wanted to know what the information was being used for. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ola. I'm from the Hopkins School of Public Health. So everybody has been talking so much about data, how we collected data, what we did with people, uh, talking with people. Uh, but what exactly did we do with the data when we um, collected it? So that's what I'm going to talk about briefly. So how or what does the data look like? So this on my right side here is like um, a snapshot of what the data looks like. Of course, it's longer than this. Uh, but we just wanted to present how it looks like um, in real life. So we have 160 of this kind of documents, uh, and we have about 20 to 30 more that were was done for the Hispanic um, population, which we are in the process of uh, transcribing and uh, coding correctly. So we have this kind of data like this presented in this form, and we uh, have it word for word. So everything that was said was actually transcribed, word for word. Nothing was omitted from this. Because we wanted to capture everything that has been said by um, interviewees, because we believe everything was very important. So we had everything um, typed out this way. And then we tried to understand what the data actually meant. And we couldn't do this until we read through every uh, interview. So all the transcript was read line by line, word for word. Of course, this took a very long time and process, but we felt this was necessary um, because if you go out there to collect data um, involving people's time, involving our own resources as an institute, then that means we also have a responsibility to make sure that we make good sense of what is being said. So we read through each interview um, transcript and then we proceeded to highlight and lay down things that people said. What did they say? We, um, earlier on, we were told that we have like seven buckets from where the questions were actually drawn from. So we wanted to see how each of these fits into each of those buckets. And then we also proceeded to organize a label of codes. Um, what they said, what it means as a whole, uh, in different parts for how we make sense of this as a whole. So it was a very, um, it was a multi-stakeholder uh, partnership. Uh, it involved people both in the community like NS and, and Roxy, NS is around there today. And then it involved people from the Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, so we're trying to see how we could match uh, people that have the methods experience with people that understand how the community works and can make sense of some of the information. And that was very important because along the line um, of coding, we got to some points in which we needed to rely heavily on people who were community members to like make us understand some of the things that was being said. So I think that was very, very um, important as well. So we went through um, a random selection of 30 transcripts individually because we were four we had to walk through at least 30 of those each. And then we came together to discuss the types of answer people were describing. We have like weekly meetings uh, where we talked about this and sometimes this would drag on for, for, for some hours. Uh, but it was very important because we needed to have the same mindset in terms of interpreting what, is, what was being said. So we also generated a preliminary code book, which was based on the interview guide and the initial transcript. So code book describes a list of codes that was used to understand uh, or to summarize some of the things that was being said. So we have a list of code book that was based on the interview guide, the questions that were asked. 
and then we discussed three random transcripts in depth as a team. And this was important because we wanted to ensure that there was consistency in how we interpret some of these um, uh, sayings or some of the statements being made by the interviewees. So we needed a system in which, even though we won't be doing this together, but we have, to have the same kind of thinking process through this. And that was very um, rewarding because it got to a point in which some of my team members could exactly know what I'm thinking as I read through a portion of the transcripts, and I could well say what they are thinking about as well. Um, this was good for consistency purposes. This took a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of time, but we felt, again, we felt it was very useful um, to do this. And then we coded six transcripts in pairs. The first process was doing it together as a team, the four of us with people in the office, and then we proceeded to working on this two in a team, individually, and then um, we come around, the two people in the team come around and discuss what was coded, and then if you have um, inconsistencies, we refer it to the bigger team um, for discrepancies to be sorted out. So that was how we finalized um, our code book, and then we individually coded the remaining transcripts. I'll turn this over to Sam um, to present the data. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just want to take a break. So we've now covered kind of the first four steps of our process and what we've done. And for those of you that have been coming to all partners meetings for all of these years, um, you've heard a lot of this and you know a lot of this and you've been through a lot of this process with us. But for those of you that are new, are there any questions about, um, just give you another chance to ask any questions about anything that was confusing about how we decided to collect this data and, and go out in the community and then how we decided to code everything and how that process went? Is everyone on board? Yeah, everyone. Um, from my understanding, it's going to go down to the start school. So, as a fast school, school's not going to so let me get let you get the right. Can you ask that again? Yes, my name is Shanks. From my understanding, they're supposed to be closing uh, many head start classes down school down in East Baltimore. Is that true? Or do you know anything about it? I don't know anything about that, about the Head Start programs. Um, there might be somebody, is there somebody here that knows? Sorry, we can um, try to try to get more information about that, but that's yeah, that's not something that we know um, off the top of our heads. Does anybody else have any questions about anything? Okay, great. So um, I just want to start right into now that we after we collected all that data, we did that really intensive coding process with some of the community members and some of the Hopkins um, team members and we identified a ways to code all of this data, what did we find that the community residents to tell, told us? So this was the fifth step in our process. We're gonna discuss some of what this data um, said to us, and then the next step is to decide as a group what our priorities as the All Partners, as a Community Health Initiative, should be um, as our next steps. So what we found was that um, community residents did identify many types of assets. Um, as Althea pointed out, they realized even in doing the interviews, there were so many different types of assets that people could identify. And that these assets really did fit into these seven buckets or seven types that we had um, kind of outlined in our interview file. But people also, since this um, interview was really a conversation, as Ernest was talking about, we really set it up to be a conversation between community residents and our data collectors. They also identified a lot of other themes that um, maybe weren't considered assets as they fell into these bucket categories of the different types, but there were also just themes that people started talking about um, in discussing their neighborhoods. So we also, in our coding process, were able to capture some of those themes that the coders felt were really important and interesting and that might be useful to the all partners and the community as we start to think about how all of this data might be helpful. So Amy and Marin are now passing out um, some of 
some documents, and you're going to get one that says summary of data. So it's a handout, it looks like this, they're passing it out, summary of the data. Um, and what you're going to see in that is a list of the various types of these assets and these themes that these 160 uh, East Baltimore community residents discussed in their interview. And through this coding process, we've been able to categorize them and um, group them up into these different types of um, assets and themes that you'll see listed here in bold font next to the little check marks in your packet. So is everybody with me with this document? And this is what we're going to be using for the rest of our meeting today to really go through this in depth in, our, in small groups and prioritize. Um, what we want to focus on next now that we know that these are the assets that, um, that our community residents have identified as important. So each of, you'll see in this uh, document that each bolded asset uh, is followed by a question. And what those questions are, are the, um, the questions that we'll be able to answer once we drill down deeper into what this data says. And so I'll explain more what it means to drill down and I'll actually talk through what that would look like and what we might be able to find once we do that. But first I want us to just go through uh, this, this sheet together and talk about all of the different types of assets that people identify. Okay, so we see on the first page, um, at the top it says bucket, physical assets, and attributes. And so these are the different types of physical assets that people talked about. So they talked about how they described their physical environment. They talked about how people upkeep and, and take care of the neighborhood. Um, they talked about the quality of life for various residents in the community. People talked about redevelopment and different redevelopment initiatives um, that were going on and how they felt about those. Um, people discussed issues with safety. They discussed um, the types of social support that they get from their community residents. Uh, they told us things about city services. And then they gave us some descriptive information about the neighborhood and also descriptive information about themselves. So if you flip to the next page, page two, you'll see at the top some of the voluntary associations that people talked about. So people discussed Facebook organizations in their communities. They discuss different neighborhood associations. Um, they, they discuss specific programs that were meant for seniors, as well as specific programs that were meant for youth. And then they also talked about other types of associations that maybe didn't fit into one of these categories, but as we were reading through, as the uh, coders were all reading through the uh, 160 interviews, they identified several other types of, of associations as well that we have information on them. Okay, so then, um, again, on page two, there's the next bucket, which is paid institutions. And people identified a whole lot of different um, paid institutions in their community. And we kind of, um, uh, we kind of divided this up into um, health-related institutions, service-related institutions, retail institutions, and then things that were related to culture and entertainment. So as Alfio pointed out, people were talking about libraries, um, People were talking about different health places that they go to get health care, um, different services like financial services or restaurants, daycare centers, um, salons, and then places that they buy things like convenience stores, grocery stores, shopping malls. So we have um, information and quotes from people talking about all of these different types of paid institutions. Uh, people discuss economic assets, so they talked about um, how they were getting their income, um, things that they did to get, to get uh, sources of income. They talked about some of their hobbies or their skills or their different interests. Um, people talked about their dream jobs, um, so some of, so what they would have want, what they would want to do if they could um, do the, the perfect thing. Uh, and they also talked about e the economic asset of home ownership, so discussing kind of whether people in their community own their home or homes or rented their homes. Um, as far as individual assets, people talked about sources of help. They talked about people that would um, be the person they would turn to to dispute um, or to mediate a dis any, if there are any disputes that came up in the community. Uh, they discussed political leaders. 
They discuss community leaders. Um, so this is on page three of your packet. And then, as Ernest mentioned, we were really interested in communication assets, and that was one of the buckets that we had been um, hoping to get information on, and people talked about that. They talked about different ways that they get formal uh, information through formal sources, like newspapers or uh, television programs, and then informal sources, um, things that aren't kind of uh, structured already. People got information from those. Uh, they talked about how they would get information from other people, so uh, just word of mouth, person to person. Then they told us who they thought were the most informed citizens in the community, and we asked um, to tell you know to them for them to talk about who they get their information from, and they identified actual um, citizens that they thought were most informed. And then they talked about sources of public data um, that were maybe publicly available that they could access as well. And then finally, we wanted to ask about um, community stories. So people told us about um, history that they know about in their community. They, they talked about um, legends, so important people or important stories um, that had gone on in the community. And then we also um, found people talking about memorable experiences that, that they had personally um, in the community in the time that they had been living here. So as I mentioned, those were kind of the assets that we found people talking about that fit into our buckets, but there were a lot of other things that people discussed that were other additional themes. And the coders in their process of discussing this decided that these were really important to single out and highlight so that we can look further into those. One of the things was food. Uh, people talked about where they get food, how they get food, um, the types of nutritious food they have in the community. And this might be helpful to us, and we, I want us to be talking about um, how we might use this kind of information moving forward. Um, people talked about uh, where they go to get their recreation. So where they go and what they do to get to do recreational activities and physical activity. Um, people also talked about where they went to socialize. So uh, what kinds of social activities they would do, and then again, where they went. Do those social activities. Uh, people discussed transportation that was available in the community. Um, and we found them talking about different types of, of transportation, so things that were run by the city, um, th things that were just run by individuals, perhaps, that um, offered transportation in the community, uh, private companies, and also people that were volunteering uh, transportation methods in the community. Um, People also talked about a lot of the amazing partnerships that are happening in East Baltimore. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about a little bit more in depth, but that was another theme that we found um, that people discussed a lot as far as assets. Um, people also talked about what they thought about the Community Health Initiative. And we actually did ask them specifically, tell us you know, if you know anything about the CHI or what your thoughts were on this interview, and they gave us some information on that. Um, and then also the quality of some of the services that are available in the community. That was something that people talked a lot about and had, certainly had opinions, um, good and bad, about some of the quality of the services and um, other things that, were, that they saw in their community. So does anybody have any questions about this list? Yes. Uh, I, I don't see on the list that you, that you collected information about the assisted living or the recovery house that are uh, moving into the neighborhood. Was there any opinion? Great question. Oh, I'm going to say it again. Oh, maybe not. Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat the question. The question was um, whether there was any information about assisted living or recovery homes. Is that right? And whether people yeah, talked cool. about that? Yep, yeah. yeah, so um, that might have been... So, so that's one of the things um, I want to talk about further when I talk about drilling down. We probably do have people that talked about that. Um, and our data collectors can tell you that, you know, out of these 160 interviews, we got people saying all kinds of things. What we tried to do is organize them into these categories. So if people talked about um, assisted living um, or recovery homes, it would likely be um, in these other associations or in maybe some of the health institutions. So once we look further into 
what people said specifically in those categories, we can find that out. And if that's a, it sounds like that's a priority for you, um, knowing about that, we can certainly, that's the kind of data that we will have to see if people are ta actually talking about that. Does that make sense? It's a great question. Oh, yeah. Well, I uh, look at the paid institutions. I mean, in East Baltimore, uh, bail bonds and the little stocks are everywhere. I'm surprised that uh, they were enlisted. Did yeah. you guys read them up? Um, so, liquor stores we might have included in convenience stores. Um, Ernest, do you want to talk a little bit more about how we decided to yeah, for, um, and it depended upon where a liquor store was, because many times we related them to convenience stores because we may have sold other things. Some of them, such as um, like a bar or nightclub, went under such things in, into the category under uh, socialization, because many times people go to those places to socialize, so they may be there. And then in other cases, when we do that, it was not being defined, but we knew if someone mentioned like a, a bar on my, a liquor store on my industry, then it went to a, uh, usually to a shopping mall or to a district. But again, if that becomes something that's interesting, the people at Sam pointed out, we can begin to pull those out. We know the can, we roughly know where they are, and we can go back and get them and name them. Exactly. So these are the kinds of questions that, that that are great that people are bringing up now, and that's what today's meeting is for, is exactly what you, you're both doing, which is saying, I have further questions. I want to know about this specific thing, and we can we have all this data and we can look in, but we wanted to ask, before we did that, we wanted to ask you, what do you care about? Um, what do you want to know more about? And that's exactly what this meeting is for. So, um, so the next step is to do exactly what you're doing, which is, um, to when we break into our small groups after dinner, we're going to be doing what you're doing, which is to talk about some of the other questions you have and prioritizing what we want to focus on next. So I mentioned this idea of, oh, sorry, did anybody else have a, yeah. Um, have they done anything about the rat problems when you call in for them to put down poison? They still, they, at one time they were saying that you had children or you had pets, you had an option to have it put down or not. I barely even see any bad patrol trucks coming through anymore, but I see them out in the county. So, is anything being done about these fall form? Um, so, yeah, we were. Like a thousand cats and ain't no one hunting rats. So, we, um, because we were focusing on assets, and so like the, the, the good things that people were doing, um, we didn't ask specifically about, about the rat problem, but it's certainly possible that, pe that if people saw that as an asset, that people, that we included it in our city services code. Um, the reason why I'm, the reason why I'm saying that, the reason why I'm saying that because they get under the hood of the cars and they eat the wires besides eating the trash. So, right, right. You know, so this is clearly, a problem. right, so it's clearly a, one of the problems that we're hoping that, um, we can identify as a group as something that's a priority, and then if that's a priority that the group decides on addressing, we can move forward with, um, with that. So, Phil. Hi. Um, under um, the coding of health, mm -hmm. um, did you? OK. Uh, were there any inquiries about where people went for medical services? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly the kinds of information we would get under that, those um, dental, medical, and Hopkins codes, is whether people said, you know, yes, I go here, yes, I go there, um, and here are the specific places. It's exactly what they right. identified? Yeah, not everybody um, chose to share that, but we do have some information for the people that did. Right, oh, I think over there. Hi, can I ask who, who has access to the information that they need to collect it? Can um, groups here, will we get um, an opportunity to view the data? Yeah, so this is the Community Health Initiative's data. Um, we collected it together. Uh, we you know, all decided it together, and that is um, exactly how it's going to be made available for, for, for your purposes. And we'll talk, and we'll, yeah, for individual groups, and we'll talk more um, 
uh, we've talked about it in the past and we'll continue to talk about exactly like the mechanisms of how we will make sure people can access it, but absolutely this is community data. I just have a question. I want to know who performed the Hispanic interviews. Good question. Um, Amy, do you mind? So uh, we brought Angelo Solera on board to do that. He uh, runs the Latino Provider Network. Yeah. Yeah, so as Ola pointed out, uh, those have been collected, and now we're working on translating them, transcribing them, and then also doing the analysis, coding them. Yeah, all these studies seem like we are going to be in these forms, but it seems like nothing is being done. And so when is this summer we can see something from these programs or these studies? Yeah. I've been to two or three different times trying to clean up the neighborhood or a better environment, health, which I think is a lot of problems over here. That's why we got health issues. And I've seen like nothing how long is it going to take when we see something? Yeah, I think that that's um, something that we've been talking about a lot in these groups, okay. and that um, that is our next priority. We're going to we're going to try to um, do something as a team, all with all of us together, um, using what we found moving forward. And we need to decide on what that is, what what people want to do. So I'm hearing the community express a lot of concerns about problems, and I know there's an assets focus, a, a strengths focus in this, and so I'm wondering how that tilts maybe even a bias to the kind of data that's collected and what will be done with that data, because if what's coming from the group is concerns about problems, where is that being captured so that it's not lost with the strengths or assets perspective? Um, we certainly, I mean, people talk, we, of course, people talked about, about, um, about problems in the interviews. Um, while we were trying to focus on assets because we felt like, um, as we talked about in the beginning of, of our meeting today, that um, people wanted to talk more about the assets and they weren't in the past being asked about those things. We tried to focus on assets, but of course, um, as is you know, coming up today, people are definitely concerned about the problems, and people in our interviews certainly did talk about problems, and those were were captured. So in the code about safety, people talked about their concerns with safety, as well as um, saying good things about how they felt about the safety of their neighborhood are. So there's, we have both good and bad captured um, based on what people said. Um, this is all based on what we heard from community members. Um, so that raw data will be available to the community as well as reports from that data? Um, yes, unless uh, if this, uh, anybody else in the UHI want to yeah, talk about. So for those of you that have been involved with us over the last three years doing this, we've had some discussions about that. Yeah. Sorry, since we're recording. So for those of you that have been involved with us over the last three or so years that we've been working on it, you'll recall that we have had several discussions about this, even from the very beginning, uh, about what to do about the data. And we need to have, we will, we need to have more discussions. But what we have discussed in the past is that for those who have been involved with the process over the time, they will have priority access to the data. And in addition to that, for, for a 12-month period. After that, others who um, maybe were not involved in the process but wanted to have, uh, have access to the data would be able to have uh, the data if there were no, you know, if there were no people who were involved in the process that wanted it. In addition to that, we talked about working together to produce whatever kinds of reports and products um, that we all felt were important and necessary. So that's the framework that we decided together we'd work with. How will it actually work? When will it? We have to discuss that. That's, again, for those of you who have been involved, we, you'll know that nothing is decided here by any one person. We talk together about everything. We, we talk about different ways of doing things, and then together we decide the best way to do it. And that will be the case for this as well as for um, anything else. Does that help answer? Yeah, how do you know what groups were involved in it? What's that? You said the groups that were involved initially will get will have access first to the data. So how do we know which groups were involved? Is it in this pronouncement? 
No, so what we're talking about, you know, the partners, people that came together in the process over the years and came to the meetings over and over again, we, we like you guys did tonight, we always have sign-up sheets and we've been communicating with them over the years through email and they've been communicating with us about their concerns. So, so we, we, we have a real good idea of who, who's been coming and who hasn't been coming. So that, that's not too hard. Just okay. How, how you get the mic is there. Okay. I'm sorry. Leon? Yeah. Um, concern. Uh, one of the concerns I have is that questions that were asked were evidently confusing to a lot of the people that you're talking with. Because when you talk about assets, they're the things that help them in the community. And when I look at this list, it's missing a lot of those things. A lot of them. Uh, when your gas and electric is about to be turned up, where do you go? The place to get you help is an asset. When your rent is due and you can't pay it, where do you go? place that you get help from is an asset. Where you get health care from if you don't have health insurance is an asset. You know, I don't see Charm City Clinic in there, and they've been signing people up for health care for over three years, four years now. That's an asset. And if you miss that, and, and it don't ring a bell, you know, somewhere an alarm should go up that we're missing the boat here somewhere. You know, when you look at, for Christmas, who do you get uh, baskets from? Who do you get food from? Who do you get toys from? You know, they're assets. And if you're missing those things, there's got to be an alarm at the gate. And apparently, they missed the alarm. Let me let me just explain. Let me let me just. They, they want to answer the data collectors. They they heard the data. I think that people are misinterpreting what the data do for. That is the purpose of the data to see why these resources are in the neighborhood and people are not using them. How can we make this more available for people? So I think that's what we're talking about when we're saying assets and asset matters. If I can, let me just let me just say it. I so think I can. My, my comment is, Mr. Leon, my to the group, the assets, like you said, what you were just saying, when we got from what we were doing the interviews, they're resources that you're talking about that everyone uses. And while we were doing the interviews, okay, they can be one of the same, but that's not what the asset map project was totally about. But when we got to the interviews, we gave our resources. We had community guides. If they needed information, we gave our resources for everything that was going on, getting food, gas, luxury, um, any Christmas baskets, all that stuff. We gave our resources while we were doing that to people that were going to interview. So, I mean, maybe I can clear this up, and, and, and if we'll, we'll see. What we're discussing, if you think about it for a moment, these guys and others sat down with people and talked for sometimes half an hour, sometimes an hour, recorded that whole thing about assets, and then somebody typed it out. Each one of those 160, really 180 when you include the, uh, the um, Hispanic ones, each one of those um, one hour things, is, when it's typed out, it's pages and pages and pages and pages of, of, of words. The words are the data, the assets, the things people talked about. If we were to bring all of that here to you now, it would be a stack of papers and words this high. That's not what we're sharing right here. It's too complicated. We haven't even been able to look at, at that level of every word for all of them. What we, were, what we did, what the coders did, was go through those transcript, transcripts and pull out themes. It's in the in the buckets are the themes. So when Leon, when you say you don't see Charm City Clinic, that's because we're not at that level yet here in reporting. But Charm City Clinic, like your place, like Men and Family Center, like other places, would certainly fit under the category one of the one of the buckets that are there. And and so the the first thing is 
that they are actually probably there. I say probably because we haven't pulled out every single one. So it's not possible at this point to talk specifically about each and every little organization or person that we talk about. It's just too overwhelming if we were to present that to you. It wouldn't be valuable. So we said, maybe if we can at least present the themes that are out there, the, the big buckets. If, if we're most, in, for example, if you're most interested in knowing where the people go, like you said, then that would be, might be voluntary organizations or paid organizations. Then we go back, we look, and we see if it's there or not. That's what we're trying to do, because it's just too overwhelming. And 160 interviews is a huge amount of work. So I think that's a, that's a source of a little bit of confusion. Did that help? Does that help at all? No. Uh, OK. Listen, Mr. Chris, the reason why I personally, it's not personal, but I believe the reason why they're saying no, I noticed I'm 60 years old, and I had gotten um, involved with so because of my mother and her father situations, elements, and everything. But to make a long story short, all these years I've been in these boys, it seems like we're the last on your data or whatever members y'all put, not so much you all, but other organizations put together the meetings that we have. It's always East Baltimore is last, last, last. And that's why we don't know anything. And, and the things that we y'all are trying to put together, we want to be a part of it, but we don't know until at the last moment it was over. So that's how the problem has been for us in East Baltimore. I, I do understand that. We, and that's one of the things that we've tried hard through this process to overcome for those who have been a part of the process. So I agree with you. You're absolutely right. Well, as always, Dr. Gibbons overanalyzes. My um, interpretation of what you were saying is that resources that were missed, right? Assets, resources, yeah, things that were missed. To reiterate on that, with the people that we had, the time that we had, and the resources we had ourselves, we gathered what we could. <laughs> There's a lot more things to be discovered and a lot more information to be shared. Of course, with anything, once a certain part is completed, you always find out where you could have done better. And this is one of those things. Um, if it was to be done again, as far as data collectors, it would be gone about in a better way, a way to gather more assets and resources. You know, um, one thing I feel is, is that resources should have been researched before data collectors even came. So we would know resources that find out resources that we didn't know and we can share with people. But all we had to go off was what we already knew. Nothing new really added to the bunch, you know what I'm saying? So did that help uh, anything you want? Thank you. to be on that uh, the men's center is a great place. I have I deal with a lot of guys that is chemical dependent. I deal with a lot of guys as drug dealers. I'm straight out with friend. And I had a young guy when well, he was a young he came to graduate from pot and he was an alcoholic. That's beautiful work as a builder. We try to get him into our uh, mission. He didn't have no record, but he had to have a medical exam before. And by carrying him to the med center, it was able to help him there. And he's been in there almost a year. You see a different person. I mean, he's totally smart. Then I have another person in the block now. This man has diabetes, high blood pressure. He had a trucking job making $100,000 a year, but they stopped him because he cannot buy that drug because blood pressure is so high. How to try to send him to places where he can get some type of help uh, for health insurance. That's what I do now. I don't know all I'm truthfully. I'm just a regular person with a high school. People go out in the streets. I deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. 
I feel their concerns. I'm really concerned to my home and our neighborhood. I, right now, I live in the uh, in Bowling Street, which I guess you call the Holland Town, 24 zone. I'm the one that get one my home, my home. So John Hopkins from this school. I'm in an area I get drug deals. I say deal with my listen to them. Talk to them. You got a whole lot of guys out there that don't want to sell drugs. We keep hitting these names on the little man. But these drugs come in this country from the big people. And that hurts my heart to see. Now I'm gonna say basically, we have white and black. But our black males railroad. Did you hear me? When our lawyers take the big money and do not ask them to have a social security number. You just pay them. I see it hurts. 16-year-old boys, they've been getting killed. Because the older ones for the drug, they're gonna say, oh no, they're lazy, they don't want to do no nothing. No, the system we have here, if they get felonies, they're not gonna get jobs. They get a job, let them go. They talk to me. I don't want to do this. I'm tired of putting my head on the back behind you all the time. I swear you got good skills, just using the wrong product. But when it comes to eat, people will do a whole lot of things. And as the economy is doing, as it's doing, you're going to see a whole lot here in America. First of all, we have forgotten. I might can't say this, but you know, sometimes you can't talk about God. But I can look back because I'm 70 years old, the Lord, that we did to see next year. I can look back and see the difference in the raising of our children, the respect. I took my daughter out of a private school because I couldn't pay it no more and put it in this school up in Henderson Hopkins and it was off the chain. So guess what? Either you stick with them or you leave them. Man, I'm having a problem with my daughter because she had learned. I said that the teachers, I don't know how they work in the schools. The kids cuss about everything. We don't have no standards. We go around and sound real nice and sound real educated. We got to get to the root of this thing. People's souls, we're losing these young boys and young girls. The girls is getting worse than the boys. We need some help. We need some on the ground help. Let these people know, first of all, we got to learn how to love one another and forgive one another and try to share with one another. I live among it. I said, I see it every day, and it hurts. And someone will talk to me. I got a guy in my block right now. He's a genius. He said, I'll call him. He'll come and talk to me. When he get finished talking to me about his problem, I listen to his soul. He stimulates my mind and go down the computer because that's how smart he is. You know what I'm saying? But they need help. How do we reach out? We have all these high stuff we're talking to. No degrees is fine. They work for it. He's somebody. Let's do something. I love the minister because that's why I went to one of the guys that need help. And they try to help. And I just said one thing. And this guy come up, he's, he's a poly uh, student, he graduated somewhere he's gonna be, but today he looks good. But bring him past it, let you see how fat that guy. <laughs> what he's doing, what he's doing wrong. And he's reaching out, singing on the car and everything. That means something you see a life transform. How you gonna how you gonna have better day because of people's hearts? All right and dirty. You gotta pick the hearts up first. Do you have other people? Thank you. So, thank you very much, everybody, for sharing. That was, um, it's important to talk about all this stuff. I just want to make sure. I know there's another question. I just want to point out. Um, we're gonna if when we go to this next document, which we're gonna do after we finish hearing from everybody, you're gonna see some of the actual places like the Mennon Family Center listed in this, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, so to answer Leon's question and what everyone's kind of addressing about things that are missing, you're gonna start to see that not everything is missing. We do have a lot of really specific data, and we can talk about some of that in the next packet. So I don't know who's next. Um, I had a question, but thank you for that answer. Um, when you guys had your data collectors, and you guys were limited in your resources, um, why wasn't there resources that encompass everything in the city of Baltimore for them to use? The question is why weren't the resources available for the data collectors to use? To give to, I'm not saying from you guys, 
but I'm saying from the person or the people who had access to the information. Why wasn't it given to the data collectors so that they could have gone to actual resources, got the adequate, accurate information, and then took it out to the public to get the correct data? Well, I can, I can try to answer I'll that. answer that right there. You want to answer that? Yeah. Well, one thing that everyone has to understand, being a data collector is almost like being a foot soldier. When you get orders from the general, you're not gonna get everything. You're just gonna get the intel to do what it is that you're, that you're told to do. So, as far as resources go, we each individually have our own knowledge of resources because it was a time where we didn't have brochures, but we had to gather knowledge from each other to say, hey, we can send you here, but how can you do that? Like, the young lady over there said, how can you do that when you're surrounded by ignorance? It's hard to get somebody to understand where you're coming from if they don't want to understand. You know what I'm saying? So as data collectors, we had many doors slammed in our face. And it wasn't even a thing that we didn't have the resources to give to somebody. They didn't want it. So what we had to do was we had to find a common ground to see, like, OK, how can we relate to these people? Once we start being relatable, it was very easy to get them to open up. Now, once you get that open up now, like, like, okay, everybody can't afford internet. Everybody can't afford cable TV to get these resources that come on. And then most of the resources that you see don't come on on daytime television. They come on late at night when somebody's sleeping and got to go to work in the morning. So, that was our job, to be daytime television with information. To go out to these communities, in, in five specific, specific zip codes and to get these people the information. Now, some people, they were okay with that, but like, like was said, some people thought they were snitching. Now, let me ask you this question. If I came to your door right now, you've never seen me, and I told you I wanted to interview you and it had to be recorded, what would you think? <laughs> and it had to be recorded, what would you think? How would I present it? Okay, this is how I present it. Me, myself, personally. No, I'm asking you that question. What? You said, how would I feel? Yeah, how would you feel? How would you present it? I'm going to present it. All right, hold on. This is the thing, though. This project was planned and thought out, but it wasn't thought out as thoroughly as it could have been. Like I said, with the resources, there's still resources that we haven't heard of in the East Baltimore, which I think that before data collectors were even brought aboard, should have been researched, provided to data collectors, so data collectors provided to the public. That's just plain and simple. That's that's the backdoor deal behind it all, you know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of things weren't <coughs> fully planned, and therefore, it left a hindrance on the execution of the plan. But as data collectors, we all had unlimited time to do what it is that they set us out to do. And not only a limited time, like we said, all our resources came from us, came from what we know. And what he had said that he forgot to mention was um, a lot of people who planned this project are not from East Baltimore. They either work at Hopkins or they can found their way some way in some other community. You know, and so that's, and that's the main reason why they gather people from the community, right? Because, like I said, you had to find a common ground to be relatable to a person in the community. And honestly, I think that people in the community really have to take over this project. Not to saying to knock them out the water or anything, but all they should be doing is taking what we're taking what we're giving them and making it happen. You know what I'm saying? Everybody in the community has to go in and really collectively do your part and turn it, turn these things back into villages. You know what I'm saying? As the old saying goes, takes a village. I think Miss Constance had her hand up. Hey, Miss Constance. Good evening. Um, I myself was uh, a data collector. 
And um, I had two questions about the process, too. Um, after we collected the data, basically they were conversations that we had with the community to find out exactly how they felt and about it and, and what they could do to improve it. But my question is, with the data that's collected, what do you suppose the impact will be? I mean, what is the purpose of collecting the data? You want, me, you want me to answer? So one of the things that has been both a strength and a challenge for some people that have been involved in the process and that are here tonight is that we don't bring answers like that. We don't say this is what we're going to do or that's what we're going to do. What we say is let's decide together about everything. So, and that included the process that we used. It wasn't decided by one or two people. We decided that process collectively. And now that we have the data, we want to share it with you. It's hard to share all of it at one time. I think this is going to be a process. It's going to take some time. And then we can decide where are the priorities. We decide, not me, not Bob, but you tell us out of what we see, I think we think the most important one or two places are here and there. And then we together work to find that data and then decide what to do with it. And then together we do with it. That's the process we established a few years ago. That's the process that we have been using to do every part of this. And that's what will continue as long as we want to continue. Is it an easy process? Absolutely not. Is it messy? Absolutely it's messy. Have we gotten it perfect? No, we haven't gotten it perfect. Have we accomplished a lot? An astounding amount. I don't know of another project, another community project, if anybody does know, correct me. I don't know of another community-based project, partnership, of this size that has accomplished this much and stayed together this long with all the difficulties as we have, as we have done. True. And so, We've accomplished a lot. We still have a lot, a long way to go. But it will, where we go and what we do is what we decide together. I would like to thank Community Health Initiative for this meeting. I have two questions. I'm going to raise a response for When I read them all, I'm going to find a seat. <laughs> um, the data collection population is the total amount of the population of East Baltimore, or is it a percentage? No, we did not speak to every single person in East Baltimore. That what is the percentage? Is it like maybe three four or one half? Well, if you, well, it depends on how you count it, but we talked to about 180 people in total. That's a very small, I mean, the estimates are anywhere from 80,000 to 100,000 people living in all of East Baltimore, depending on how you cut it. We talked to 180. You talked to 180. Yeah. Okay, the second leads to the second question that I'm asking. Will you be doing another data collection to reach the majority of responsible population? Again, that's partly up to us. Again, we, we I don't decide any part of this. We just talk. asking questions. You know, no, no. And I'm, I'm just, okay. I, I don't remember your face. Correct me if I'm wrong. So that's why I'm sort of giving you a little bit of background. Um, so I, I can't tell you, yes, we will, no, we won't. We, as we talk about it and we find it, we're going to find things, wow, we didn't get enough about this, or we didn't talk to these people, or we didn't go to this neighborhood and say, maybe we should. And if we, if we collectively decide that, we look for resources to do that, we try to go. Because I'm curious to find out um, who is the targeted audience. The other question I have, I read, I mean, you saw us, it showed up on the screen, that uh, the data collected was a lot of problems. Now, it was general. I'm sorry, what, uh, were, you, specific. what, were, what were you referring to? Okay, but I was looking at the beginning. It talks about the data collected um, from the population that you collected the data from. There were a lot of problems. Oh, people talked about problems. A lot of problems. Okay, these problems, um, they're not um, specified. What are the problems? What are the specifics? So again, there, there, the focus of this, we were trying to talk about the positives, about the strengths, 
And one of the things that we found out very early, I mean, we heard from community for many, many times, you know, we've got positive things in this community. We got good things in this community. Nobody ever asks about them. We know things that you guys don't know. We need to talk about those things. We don't need, how many times have we been surveyed about the negative things? How many times have you come out here talking about the trash? How many times have we complained about it? I've heard that, I've been living and working here for 23 years, and I've heard that a million times. And what was different about this time is that people wanted us to talk about the positive things. That's why we decided to do it. But guess what? When we started to do it, even with the data collectors and others who live in this community, we live in a community that's saturated with negative, it becomes hard to think about the positive. Because we, as we ask people about positive things, sometimes they still talk about negative things. Exactly. And, and that's, why, that's why some negative stuff did come out. And is in there, as well as many positive things. But we, ha we don't have the list here of all of those things. That's if any and everything, there's a negative and a positive, the balance. Right. But just like this lady said, that we can talk and help out to make East Baltimore better. This is creating a healthier East Baltimore together. Right. Okay, that's why I asked the question. And Thank you, Chris. Question. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we don't have the whole list here today, but if you tell us there's a priority area here, and I want to know the assets and the and the problems, we can get it. Well, we will get it. That's why we're here to try to find out. It's so much data, we don't know where to begin, and we don't want to begin with our priorities. So that's why we're here tonight to try to begin the conversation about where should the priorities be, where should we look to get this information and share it with you. Okay. Oh. Anybody else? Oh, Sorry. Hi, I'm Elithia. I'm one of the data collectors. And I only can talk about it from my perspective because when we came in and we got trained and everything, but they already um, had this project in play maybe years before we got here. And from my understanding, so it's like not any confusion, the only point of this project is to bring out the good things of the community members in East Baltimore. Because we can talk about the bad things and get some kind of, we want some kind of resolution to everything we're going through, no matter what your age or your status. But this was the uh, point of this project, just to bring out the good things so they can break, uh, like bridge a gap between Johns Hopkins and the people in East Baltimore because they can't really relate. So that was the point of it. So when we went out and we didn't have resources, it's because they didn't know that we had to have them for the residents because they wanted to complain and they wanted them until we brought it back, until we said they need this stuff. So then we start coming together with resources to help them to help them to get them to do the interviews because they didn't want to do them. So that wasn't the like that's not what they put together to get resources and to help people because people always need that. So that's probably like their next phase of it. But the asset map is just to bring out the good stuff. So if it was stuff that they missed, it's only this is their first time they will tell you doing this. So it's a lot of kinks, a lot of stuff that has to be worked out. So when you keep bringing up, you know, like bad stuff and stuff that we have to work on, we, they have to get to that, hopefully with their project, if that's what they're trying to, you know, go with. But for the most part, this is just about what they did about the good stuff. What, like when we interview people, they said a lot of good stuff that we didn't even know that existed. And so that's what they're working on to go, you know, step by step. So if you keep, um, you can ask questions about bad stuff and, you know, what's going on in our community, but that was not the goal of this particular project. Away from um, what I wanted to initially say, and some of the stuff was some answered or not. But um, I've been with the initiative from the beginning. I was on um, several committees, and uh, initially we were going to do a health assessment, which ultimately turned into an asset mapping assessment. I attended the asset mapping training and everything. Now, my concern is that today, I was hoping that we would come back and look at the physical assets that's in this community. Not the good things in the community, not the bad things in the community, but to see assets such as um, healthcare facilities that are working with people who don't have income, people, people who are living on the street. I want to see some physical assets, not things. We've been working on this three years. We should have some 
assets that are uh, real. When I say real, names of businesses, names of resources, not themes. This is like kicking the bucket down the road, going over it again. Part two, I participated in the interview. And the questionnaires, I was very, very disturbed. Okay, according to our introduction here, it says our original goals were. Something's changed. I was not aware. And that's why I'm concerned, because I've been on giving my time and energy for three years, hoping to produce something real in three years. If we haven't produced it in three years, when are we going to produce it? Because tonight, I really was looking for a list of physical resources that reside in East Baltimore, not, again, stories. And that's what's happening. And what I'm thinking is the questions that's on this list about um, the assets, these are questions. They're not solutions. And uh, based on the um, training and things we do with asset mapping, we're supposed to identify the assets, connect them to people, and provide solutions. This is where we should be in this stage. So today, I'm kind of disappointed because I'm not seeing any physical assets that rings a bell to me in these form. I still have no names. All I got is themes. You know, I don't know what Miss B do for the kids down the street when the parents can't get home in time to pick them up from school and things like that. These are what we call real assets in our community that's needed. Um, what if, what if we do have some of those. We do have some of those. And it's, we haven't gotten to that part of the presentation. So in just the next slide, actually, we're going to give you some of those actual assets. It's okay. just that there's so many. Can we so go many. to the next slide, please? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, what I was looking for when it says summary of data, yeah, so I, I think um, if everyone, so this is, that's exactly right. Um, can everyone go to the next packet that we have, which is at the top, it says, what did we learn about partnerships? So what we did, um, I hear you, um, Phyllis, and what you're saying about how we're looking for answers. And what Chris was trying to say is the answers could fill up five books. And so we, and, and we have them, though. We have a lot of them. And what I wanted to share, what we want to share with you today is an example of what some of those lists could look like. So if you look in this um, second packet, what did we learn about partnerships? So in this code, in this, the, the, um, the, the code that's on your other sheet, it was, there was one called partnerships. And what I did was I looked at the 81 quotations that people said talking about partnerships and collaborations and I tried to summarize some of those. So this is an example of what we can do with the data that we had. So if everyone can turn to that, and you can see um, at the top it says, community associations and organizations and partnerships between those. And there's a quote right underneath, and these are the types of quotes we have about people talking about the Resident Advisory Board is an organization that oversees all the tenant councils. We represent Baltimore City, public housing, Section 8, and scattered sites. We oversee all the tenant council and all the different kinds of help, um, different kinds of help out as much as we can. We're policy setters. So this is an actual quote. This is what the data looks like from somebody that we um, talked to. And then you can go through this and see just some of the other types of really specific partnerships that people identified that we can list out. Um, so the second one is community resident engagement with all of this whole list of of uh, other community partner, other community organizations, or other people in the community that, that people actually specifically said, I partner with these people. And that's an asset that we have, is that these partnerships exist. So you can go through these um, and get an idea about how we have the answers to a lot of those questions, but we just couldn't print out, you know, 500 um, pages of these. Why not? Well, because part of that is that we, it's so much of it, that we need to, it takes time to actually do that. And I understand the frustration with that we've been spending three years, but it's just the honest truth of how long it takes to do this. Um, that we spent the summer coding, um, and we met every week, and a group of four people coded it, and this is just, it's where we are, and it's our next step is to start putting things like this together, or other things based on what you want, and what we hear, what you all, we all discuss together, or what we want. So, the only the thing that changed 
was that in original, the first few meetings, the thoughts that we had were sending around doing a needs assessment. We have not done a needs assessment, and the group has decided that we don't want, we didn't want to do one. We wanted to do an asset mapping. That's, that's what changed. That's the only thing that, that changed. Let's do this. There are a lot of questions, and we're going to get to every last one of them. We want to, we want to help you both understand what we have. I don't really have a question. I have a statement. I well, just think you have to see yourselves as assets. There's enough people in this room that you guys share your phone numbers and email address. It's good that Hopkins is collecting the data. That's what we need. We don't have the labor to collect the data. Let them collect the data and let us disseminate the data after they collect it. There's enough of us in here that we are the assets. That's what we're hoping for. Collect the data and the data. So that we can come together and we be on the ground like she is. So let's do this. Let's do this. Let's get some dinner and let's come back to these tables and we'll we'll keep the conversation going. We'll we'll move to the next steps.